that are joining us from, uh, is that uh, Kenya? Yeah. And also from Russia and yes, and all over Namibia. Amen. You're most welcome from all over the world. Uh, I'm Bishop Dr. Julius Quedi. I'm going to start with the first session on uh, marriage foundation. Amen. On the foundation of marriage. And uh, I would just like us to start reading a scripture from the book of Genesis. Uh, the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, we see that uh, the Lord calls or creates Adam and he creates Eve in the book of Genesis uh, chapter 2. Uh, but if we go to Genesis 1, we'll find in Genesis 1, let me just go there quickly, uh, towards the end, verse 26. Amen. Genesis 1 from verse 26, the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Amen. Uh, but then uh, verse 31, he says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. But when we go to chapter 2, then we find uh, the creation of uh, Eve from her husband. Amen. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord says, uh, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then he said, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground of all the wild animals. This is verse 19 that I'm reading. And all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Uh, verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the men's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Amen. Uh, this is a very uh, important scripture. And from this scripture, we understand, uh, number one, the purpose of marriage. Uh, and number two, uh, God's design for marriage, what he designed marriage to be the structure that God has instituted uh, in order to, uh, uh, to make this institution called marriage. Amen. And a few things we pick up from these scriptures, we see that God created man. It was his idea. So he created man and then he created woman. And uh, in creating woman, he said there was a need for creating both man and woman. After he created Adam, he gave him... Uh, the mission. He gave him responsibility over the earth uh, to take care of the earth, but most importantly, uh, to worship God on this earth, because he said he created Adam in the image of God. And then 
when he brought forth the woman, he said, it is not good for a man to be alone. Uh, he said, I will make him a helper suitable for him. I'll make him a help meet. Uh, and the word that is used there for uh, helper is a very interesting word because uh, when you try to trace it through scripture and to see where does this word appear in the, in the Bible, you find that it always refers to God's help. Uh, that when God created Eve and said she will be um, Adam's help, help meet. So that word is always used to refer to God's help, whether it's in the book of uh, Psalm or in other passages in the prophets. And it could rightly be said that by creating Eve, God essentially uh, was providing his help to Adam. So as it were, Eve was God's help to Adam. And, and I think that's a very, uh, very important thing to take note uh, that uh, uh, God providing Eve was, was as it were, God's help, God's help in human flesh uh, that uh, Adam may be uh, uh, helped. But it, it says uh, that word has a meaning that uh, is quite fascinating to comprehend. Uh, and that meaning is uh, the word sako, meaning to help in times of need. And so we see that that's one of the objectives that uh, God had uh, instituted this, inst uh, this institution called marriage. So he brought forth Adam and then he brought forth Eve. And then, but remember, he created them in the image of God. So meaning, Adam and Eve were both created in the image and likeness of God. And uh, it's also important to take notice that Adam and Eve were both created by God. It was God's idea. And bringing them together also was the idea of God. So this brings forth the sovereignty of God over the institution called marriage. That God himself is the author. God himself is the architect. God himself is the designer. And God himself uh, is the one that calls uh, uh, husband and wife together. In the book of Proverbs, it says that uh, houses and riches may come from our fathers, but a prudent wife comes from the Lord. So we see that the Lord God is sovereign over marriage. Uh, and, and, and that becomes a very good foundation uh, to start off our married lives, to realize, to appreciate, and to recognize the fact that God must be at the very center. Since it is God who created us, it is God who came up with the idea of marriage, that it was not a, an, a human idea, or human plan for the marriage institution to be created, then we need to appreciate that fact and, 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 and that God must be at the center of our marriage relationship. And, uh, and for that, then we, we, we have to realize that then if God must be at the center of our marriage relationships, then that means God's purposes must take preeminence over our marriage relationships. Amen. That God himself must take preeminence. God's purpose must be the overarching purpose for why we should get married. Of course, uh, we know that a lot of people, when they get married, usually they don't have the idea. They don't have God at the forefront of their marriage, of, the, of, their, of, their, of, their, of their minds, for why they want to get married. Uh, a number of people... They get married in order just to find a life partner, or they get married in order to have some sort of security, financial security or physical security. Uh, some other people, uh, they get married because uh, they, they feel lonely. Uh, others, they, they, they get married because they, uh, they want children, or they want a visa, they want some form of inheritance, or they want to gratify their own uh, appetites, their own uh, selfish appetites, be it uh, uh, affection or uh, uh, sexual appetites or, or such things. But then these become selfish reasons. If these become the, 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 the main reason why we are getting married, then such a marriage is, is in trouble from the word go. Yeah? To, to get married because one wants to have uh, a lot of income, to, wants, wants to have political influence, or one wants to have a good inheritance, or because one merely wants to have children, then that's a very short-sighted vision 
uh, for getting married because then that becomes a very selfish reason. And if you get married to somebody hoping that you'll have children, but then you don't end up getting children, you'll eventually end up breaking this marriage, yeah? Or even abandoning God himself. Uh, the, uh, there is an example in the, in the global news media. There was a pastor and his wife that uh, always wanted, before they became Christian, they've always wanted children. And they became Christians because they thought that, you know, God answers prayer and they will have children if they become uh, uh, Christians. And until they were elevated into the office of pastor, they both became pastors and they were praying to have a, uh, to have a child, even just one child. But many years go went by and they didn't have a child until they became disillusioned. They thought, oh, this Christian, this thing of Christianity doesn't work because God has not answered our prayers to have a, to have a child. And, and owing to that, they ended up actually backsliding, leaving the faith, you know, abandoning their call of, become, of being a pastor and eventually abandoning the, the, the whole faith. So having a child as your main goal for getting married is a short-sighted vision uh, uh, or to get married because you want to be happy. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a short-sighted vision that is misinformed. Because marriage is not about uh, uh, finding happiness or finding somebody that can fulfill you. Yeah? With all our selfishness that we have, uh, we, we, we mistakenly say, think that by getting married, then we will be fulfilled. But that's a very distorted view of marriage because we are very selfish people. We are very angry people. We are jealous people. We are uh, uh, proud people. Now, if you find somebody who's also proud, and then you bring them to try and compliment you, <laughs> or you bring them, or you find another selfish person to come and complete you, then that is selfishness to the nth degree. So uh, to, to find somebody to compliment you, to, to fulfill you, to, uh, 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 to, to perfect you, uh, it, is, it, is, it is also a short-sighted vision. So the only reason, the only overarching reason, the only overarching a purpose for which we should pursue marriage, that our marriages should exist, is what is laid down for us in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, the glory of God, the image of God. And you see very clearly throughout scripture that when God called man and woman, he has called them to be his image. His image. And for what reason? He said that he wants that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And marriage is at the center of that mission, uh, at the center of that mission for God to fill the earth with his glory. Because he wants that the two people that he has brought together in holy matrimony then become the vehicle through which he will multiply people all over the earth to bring forth praises and glory and uh, honor <clears throat> unto the Lord. Amen. And so we say, so marriage exists for the glory of God. Marriage exists uh, that, uh, that we may bring fear unto God for the, for the glory of God. What is it that brings glory to God? Holiness, by living a holy life. That our marriage should have a goal in mind. The goal of marriage is that we, we may become more holy. Amen? That we may become more righteous. That we may become more God-fearing. That through our marriage union, the fear of God may be uh, 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 exhibited to the world, may be reflected to the world, that the, that the world may see the unconditional love of God in us, because he calls husband and wife, two very imperfect people, to reflect the perfect love of God. So marriage really uh, 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 exists for God and God alone. But now when you, when you look in the scriptures, when you look at the many, many scriptures that, that, that talk about marriage, we are then able to find the, 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 the characteristic that our marriages should behold, the characteristics that should define our marriages, our marriage relationships. What are those characteristics that should define our marriages? Uh, as we said in the book of Genesis chapter, chapter, um, chapter two, he says that uh, he created Eve that she may be a help meet for Adam. So meaning that marriage then should be characterized by that helping hand, that meaning that the wife be 
the helper of the man, as the scripture says. Amen. And then it says in uh, 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 in the same uh, in the same scripture of Genesis chapter two that uh, uh, it's not good for a man to be alone. That the characteristics, features, characteristic features that uh, that define marriage is also companionship. So these are not the overarching purposes of marriage, but that that as we come as together to bring glory to God, to bring uh, to worship God, to reflect his image through our marriage union, uh, to allow God himself to reveal himself to the world through us. He says, then this union is defined by woman being a helper to the man. Then he says that there be companionship, that the man not be alone, and the, and the woman too, that there be companionship, because he said, this is a partnership, this is a covenant, it's a covenant relationship. He says that uh, another thing that describes, that characterizes a marriage union is uh, that the, the two spouses or the man should leave his father and his mother and unite to his wife. That means they should become a new entity. They should become a new institution, amen? So when, you get, when a man gets married to his wife, he's not getting married to, their, to, to, to her parents or she's not get, getting married to his parents, but the two are becoming one flesh. And he said, they should leave father and mother and they should cleave together. They should cling together. They should um, unite together. And then he said, uh, naked and not ashamed in the same scripture of Genesis chapter two. So meaning this is the rightful place for sexual union in the, in the marriage relationship. And then he says, marriage exists also. Another characteristic that should define our marriages, he says, to keep the ways of the Lord. You find that in the book of Genesis chapter 18. Uh, when, when the Lord was going to judge Sodom, and then he said, shall I hide from Abraham, from Abraham what I'm going to do, seeing that he's going to keep the ways of the Lord and to teach his family to fear the Lord. So our marriages exist, uh, that, is, that is another thing that should characterize our marriages, that we may uh, keep the ways of the Lord. Then he says to do justice and righteousness, because marriage is the basic unit of, of, of our society, of, 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 of human, uh, um, uh, of mankind, yeah, that's where everything begins. Leadership, that's where it begins. Uh, that's where also uh, 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 ethics begin, everything. The education begins at home. That when God calls men and women and children in this uh, family union, he said that uh, they should do justice and righteousness. That if there is to be justice and righteousness in our societies, in our countries, in our nations, uh, in our cities, then it must begin at home, amen that at home, that's where justice and righteousness should begin. That the marriage union is also characterized by faithfulness, that the husband and wife should be faithful to one another, that they should be trustworthy to one another, uh, that the marriage union is also uh, characterized by partnership. It is characterized by a marriage covenant. When you go to the book of uh, Malachi chapter two, we find the Lord is rebuking uh, 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 divorce in Israel. And then he said that, uh, this is supposed to be a marriage covenant. He said, why did he bring them together? He has brought them together that there may be a godly offspring. Again, going back to, uh, to what we read in the book of Genesis, that he said, be fruitful and multiply. And uh, in the book of Isaiah and somewhere in Zechariah, he said that the glory of the Lord, of the knowledge, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord may fill the earth as the water covers the sea. And then marriage then becomes that vehicle that God uses to bring forth glory unto God on the face of the earth. And so that's why he wants us to bring forth godly offsprings, a people that are going to glorify God, a people that are going to bring uh, honor unto the Lord, the people that are going to fear the Lord. And so that's another thing that characterizes marriage union. What else should characterize our marriage unions? He said, lasting, that marriage should be a lasting union. It should be lifelong, uh, meaning uh, marriage is not for one week, one year. Uh, 20 years, 30 years. Marriage is for a lifetime until the Messiah comes. Amen. So when we enter the marriage union, uh, we, should, we should have that in perspective that this is, there is no going out. Amen. But that doesn't mean you are trapped because if you, if you, if you are entering marriage and you are hearing that uh, marriage is for a lifetime and then you begin to think you are trapped, then you're in marriage for, for the wrong reason. Amen. So because it is not a trap. Marriage is for lifelong. It should be lasting. It should be lasting. Amen. It should not be something that uh, like, like having a car. 
<laughs> Meaning that the reason why it should be lasting is because marriage is honorable. Marriage, we should honor it. We should uh, respect it. We should, we should treasure our marriage relationships. And so if we are only going to have uh, to be married for a few years, then, then we have devalued the value that God himself has put upon the marriage union. Uh, as he says in the book of Hebrews chapter uh, 13, he said, marriage should be honored by all. Mary, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse four. And if marriage is to be honored by all, then it must be lifelong. It must be lasting. Amen. And then that brings forth the, 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 the quality of uh, the marriage relationship. He said, marriage is a place of protection. Uh, it's a place where husband protects his wife and the wife also protects her husband. Yeah, and protection can be manifested in different ways. Uh, there should be physical protection, obviously, to protect one another from physical harm in different shapes and forms. Uh, we should protect one another financially, meaning we should be financially responsible in our relations, in our marriage uh, uh, relationships. He said also emotionally, we should also protect one another emotionally and not expose one another and not expose each other. Amen. Uh, as you see. Uh, a lot of lot of issues going on in the world today. Uh, you find that uh, a lot of people uh, are divorcing and very nasty, very nasty stuff go, go on there. People are exposing things that have happened, you know, that you can't even repeat here, you know. So we should be able to protect one another in our marriage relationships. It is, it is incumbent upon us. It is our responsibility to protect each other. Husband must protect the wife. Wife must protect the husband. Things that go on in there must be between uh, uh, the two. He said they are no longer two, but one, uh, but one flesh. And so other people should be excluded. So we should protect ourselves also from, from uh, sometimes also from our family members because our family members at times, they want to go in between and, uh, and ruin or bring division between husband and wife. And we should also protect ourselves from, uh, most importantly, protect ourselves from our own selfishness, yeah? Protect ourselves from our own sins. As the Bible says, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this body, uh, from this flesh? Uh, because our flesh is very corrupt. We are very corrupt people, and uh, we often don't realize it when we get into marriage. And it is that corruption that, uh, that poses the greatest threat to our marriage relationships, our character flaws. Uh, 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 the words we speak, the way we behave towards one another. Th that is also something that we need to protect each other from. Hallelujah. Some, some of us have bad anger, bad, bad, uh, we get angry very quickly. Some of us, we, we are very quick at um, assuming the worst of our spouses, and, uh, which is very common. And so we need to, to learn also to protect, our, to protect our spouses from our sinful self. Uh, what else should characterize our marriage unions? Uh, our marriage union, again, should be, uh, uh, pro uh, we should protect ourselves from, from the enemy, from Satan. Because we know that, as we said, uh, marriage exists for the glory of God. That marriage exists to reflect the image of God. And so because of that, we know that Satan, the enemy, does not like anything that is good, does not like anything that brings glory to God. And so in as much as... Uh, uh, we protect ourselves from our, from our own sinful flesh, from other people that are trying to intrude. But we also have to realize that the enemy can also use our own selfishness. The enemy can also use, uh, can also be behind uh, some of these, uh, th these things. So we need, and also spiritual, spiritual, spiritually, also the enemy is, is trying to attack us, trying to destroy our marriages. So we need to be alert. We need to be on high alert and realize that we are not just fighting flesh and blood, Amen. We are also fighting a spiritual warfare. So that, that is why now in our marriage relationships, we need to protect ourselves also from the enemy, from the threats of the enemy, from the threats of Satan. Uh, that because he is always at work trying to bring division, trying to bring destruction, trying to bring uh, dishonor and trying to uh, sabotage the plan of God in our uh, marriages. Uh, what else uh, should characterize our marriage union? Uh, we should realize that our marriage union, uh, which in, in our marriages, we should realize that God is the designer. And so it is God's purpose and it is God's will that must be fulfilled 
in our marriages. Right. So meaning marriage should exist for the will of God, for the purpose of God. Hebrews chapter, not Hebrews, but Romans chapter 12 says, God's purpose is good. God's purpose is perfect. God's will is, uh, is good, pleasing, and perfect. And so that good, pleasing, and perfect will of God should be what characterizes our marriage, meaning we should submit to the purposes of God in our marriages, meaning we should submit to the will of God in our marriages. Uh, there should be oneness in spirit and in body, that in our marriages, it should be characterized by oneness, as uh, uh, Ovasia Amalia is going to talk about later on. There should be oneness. We have to realize that we are a team. And we have to work together as a team. We have to work together uh, as a team and not as, uh, as enemies in our marriages. Hallelujah. So that is, that is another characteristic that should define our marriage relationships. Uh, oneness in body and oneness in spirit. Meaning we have... Uh, we, we are working together towards a common goal and not husband is trying to achieve this and the wife is trying to achieve something else. No, we should be fixed of one purpose, of one mind and of one will and of one goal. Uh, here's another thing. Our marriages should, should also be characterized by no divorce. Hallelujah. We already talked about marriage should be a lifelong institution. Marriage is characterized by long tenureship, patience, endurance. So then that means divorce should be out of the equation. Hallelujah. Should not even be plan B or plan C or plan D or plan whatever. So meaning uh, uh, it is lifelong, no divorce. Meaning there, there must not be separation. The Lord Jesus said in the book of uh, uh, Matthew that uh, whatever God has put together, let no man put asunder. So meaning our marriage relationship should be characterized by uh, 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 cleavage. We should really stick together, inseparable, meaning we should, be, we should both be uh, committed to, uh, to this union, to this unity uh, in spirit, meaning we should not allow our relatives, our parents, our fathers, the police, the government, lawyers to bring separation in our marriage relationships. Here's another thing that should characterize our marriage relationships. Purity. Amen. Purity is another thing that should uh, characterize our marriages. Uh, purity in, uh, especially as, the, as Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept holy or kept pure. The marriage bed should be pure, especially uh, uh, in the question of sexual purity. There must be purity in that aspect because uh, the Lord often uses marriage uh, to, to speak about the relationship that he has with his church. So that here's another purpose for marriage, that the church, that the, that the marriage union should be a vehicle that reflects the, re, the relationship that Christ has with his church. And you know that whenever the church or a believer abandons the Lord, the Lord always characterizes that as idolatry idolatry, worshiping another. And then he said, but then he also characterized that as adultery, spiritual adultery. And so in the same way, uh, if, if, if we are not faithful, if, we, if our marriage bed is not, is not pure, then that is characterized by adultery, meaning idolatry also. And so there should be purity. We should strive to be pure in our relationships, in our marriages. Uh, the, um, here's another thing that characterized marriage union, submission to one another. It says submit one another, but then it also says that the husband is the head, as Christ is the head of the wife, I mean of the church. And then he also says that then the wife uh, is the body, like the church is the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So, so, so there you go now. The, the spiritual uh, um, uh, leadership uh, of the marriage union says the husband should be the head, meaning he's the leader, he's the high priest because he takes after Christ, he's the covering of this marriage. And then he says, he's the one that is covering the wife, spiritually speaking. And then he says that the, the wife, the wife, while the husband is the head, like Christ, then the wife, he says, is like the church. And then he says that the church, that's now, I'm now uh, referencing from the book of Ephesians chapter five. He says, now the wife must submit to the husband in all things. That's another thing that should characterize our marriages, submission. Not only should be there submission to one another, but then he says, wives submit to your husbands in all 
things. Then he said that um, husbands, however, should love their wives. Now, this is another topic that Mama Bishop is going to get into. Uh, whereas husbands should love their wives. Then he said the wife should respect their husbands. Uh, and uh, this becomes now a very important aspect uh, that brings uh, uh, conflict and a lot of uh, commotion in marriage. Because when we get into marriage, we usually don't know how to love and respect one another. And we find a lot of uh, division comes in owing to that. So, but then he said, our marriages should be characterized by husband loving their wives and wives respecting their husbands. And the way the husband should, 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 uh, should love the wife is the very same way that Christ Jesus died for the church. Ephesians, uh, Philippians chapter two from verse five. So he says, the way the husband should love his wife is the way that Christ came, humbled himself and died for the church. Meaning the husband should be willing and ready to lay down his life for his beloved wife. Meaning he should consider her first before he considers himself. So this whole notion of I'm the man, I'm the man. And so meaning everything I say goes and uh, the wife must serve you. No, 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 that's not what Christ has, has designed. Praise the Lord. So sorry, there was a um, network, network glitches there. Can you hear me? Yes, Amen. 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 All right. So I was talking about um, how husbands should submit themselves. I mean, should, uh, should love their wives in, the, in uh, uh, the way Christ loves the church. And, that, and, and the way that Christ loved the church is by humbling himself, the way of the cross, to humble himself, and to lay down his life for his wife. And so he says, that is the way, the way of the cross. That is the way that husband should follow uh, in order to love his wife, lay down his life for his wife, consider the wife first rather than himself. And I was saying that, uh, so the wife does not become the slave of the man. Uh, we have a distorted view in, in, a, in a lot of our culture. We think that uh, a lot of men think that when they get married, then they are getting married to a housewife or, or just a, I mean, housekeeper, yeah? A housekeeper, somebody who's just going to fulfill all his fantasies and desires. But that's not the design of marriage. The design is that there should be mutual, res uh, mutual respect and honor and that the husband should be willing to lay down his life and that the wife should respect her husband. But then there is love, there is unconditional love here and there should not be force, yeah? And so the design is that there be no force that nobody has to be forced to, husband should not, should not be forced to love the wife, wife should not be forced to, 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 what, to submit to the husband, but they should do it out of a willingness of heart. And then he said, um, uh, so, so the love that the husband should have for his wife must be a sacrificial love. Hallelujah. Must be a sacrificial love. And then he says, uh, marriage should also be characterized by holiness. Amen. Uh, because, and and, and we say, as we said before, because marriage exists for the glory of God, marriage exists to reflect the image of God, then the, 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 the highest form of reflecting the image of God is by living a holy life. When our marriages are committed to the holiness of the Lord, then that becomes the perfect avenue for us to reflect the image of God. Uh, he says uh, marriage should be, uh, uh, as he says that, Christ cleaned the, 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 the church with, by his word. Uh, the, marriage of, the marriage union should be built on the word of God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 again. That's another characteristic, that our marriages should be built on the word of God. Our marriages should be radiant marriages, meaning they should reflect the rays of the light of God. As he said that uh, we are a city on a hill, uh, a, light, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We are the light of the world. It begins with our marriages. Hallelujah. Uh, he says, our marriages should be without wrinkles, spot, and blemish. Uh, we should love ourselves, uh, uh, we should love others, we should love our spouses just as we love ourselves. So marriages really characterized, must be characterized by selflessness. Amen? Putting, some, putting your spouse first before yourself. Uh, he says, wives should respect their husbands, and husbands also should respect their wives, in another part of the scripture. 
And then he said that uh, we should not take advantage of one another. So, so meaning we should really be committed to mutual growth, to mutual uh, spiritual growth. Uh, we should be committed to what is good for both, for, 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 for us both. Husband should not be preoccupied with his own uh, desires, with his own ambitions. Wife should not be preoccupied with her own ambitions, with her own desires, but there should be one union. Hallelujah. And, and really, when you look in society, you can see the, the stark contrast between a marriage that is built on the word of God and a marriage that is built on the material things of this earth. Yeah, you can, you can just see the contrast uh, between that, between the two. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and because the marriage union uh, should be patterned after the relationship between Christ and the church, and so then humility becomes a very important uh, tenant, a very important pillar in the growth and maturity of our relationships. And so without humility, uh, uh, our, our, our oneness is going to be threatened very, very much because it is humility that really allows us to, uh, uh, to come down from our high horses of pride, from our high horses of anger and, uh, 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 and self-righteousness allows us to, to be humble enough to, to learn, to listen, and, uh, and to grow in every aspect of our marriage relationships. Amen? So we should remember that uh, uh, when, when, when for, for those that are not married, that when you are planning about getting married, God must come first. Hallelujah. Must come first. Sometimes we have our own uh, ideas, you know. I want a man who's tall. I want a woman who's short. I want a woman who's this. I want a man who's that. And, and these are really, uh, even though God can use these, but uh, they are really more about us. They are more about us. I want a woman who's beautiful. I want a man who's rich. They, they are more about us. And because they are all built on, uh, on the earthly uh, qualities. They're all built on earthly qualities. And we know that earthly things, earthly qualities, earthly things, they all fade away quickly. The man you say, I want to marry a woman who's very beautiful. What, what, what will happen then when she loses her beauty? <laughs> yeah. And a woman says, I want to marry a man who's rich so that I don't ever have to worry about financial security. Then what will happen when he loses his job? Are you going to uh, tell him to abandon his God? Like, uh, like Job's wife was telling him to abandon his God. <laughs> Amen. And so if we fix our purpose on the things of this world, if the things of this world become our purpose, and we know that the things of this world, they are always shifting according to the winds of this earth. Yeah. And so when the, when the cultural winds blow, then our earthly focuses also, they shift. They are not constant. Yeah. But when we fix our eyes on the Lord, when we put Christ at the center of our marriages, when Christ becomes the rock, the solid rock foundation of our marriages, then our marriages are in the right place to succeed, uh, are in the right place uh, to, to bring glory and honor unto the Lord, and in the right place also to bring us the happiness and the joy that we are so pursuing relentlessly. But that joy and, 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 and true happiness in marriage comes not by pursuing joy and happiness, but by pursuing Christ. Amen. When we learn to love God more, the Lord in turn will teach us to love our spouses more. So he turns that love that we direct towards him, he turns it around and he fills us with more love for our spouses. So that's why we cannot afford to keep Christ out of the picture. Because when Christ is out of the picture, then all that is left is us trying to charm one another with our beauty, charm one another with our with our, with, our, with our earthly possessions, which uh, can only, which only lasts for a short time. And then after a while, you need something higher. You need something higher to, to excite you. But when Christ is the fixed purpose, when Christ is the rock, solid foundation on which, on which we build our marriages, then that marriage shall stand strong, shall overcome any trial and challenge that, is, uh, that the enemy is going to bring our way. Hallelujah. And that brings me to, our, to, to, this, to the end of this topic. Uh, 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 as you can tell, there is much to, to share, but uh, uh, we, we, we don't have the luxury of so much time. <laughs> Amen. Uh, that brings me to the end of our, of our, of our session. 
Uh, is there somebody with a question on this uh, on this topic, on this topic of uh, marriage foundation, building the right foundation for your marriage? Is there one or two people that would like to um, to ask a question? You are welcome to just unmute yourself and then uh, ask the question. Is there anybody with a question? Or you want uh, you want clarification uh, on something that I said that didn't sound clear? Anybody? No? Was I that clear? <laughs> I'm sure I didn't cover everything. I'm sure I didn't uh, uh, touch on everything. So is there anybody? Anybody at all? Hallelujah. Is there anybody at all that, uh, that wants clarification? That has a question to ask on building the right foundation for your married life, whether you're married or not yet married. Okay. Now, in absence of that, okay, um, the Archbishop will, will start uh, ministering in the next four minutes. Let me give her time to prepare herself. I'll just play a, a, a song interlude. Amen. I'll just play a song interlude to allow her to uh, prepare herself for uh, to to present her, her topic on uh, expectations in marriage. Mm -hmm. 